Good evening, everyone. I thought this day and this time would never come. It's been so long, and it's so great to welcome you back to another edition of OSU Research on Tap. I'm Kenneth Sewell, the Vice President for Research at Oklahoma State University, and we are bringing back what became a wonderful tradition over time, and we laid aside a little over a year and a half ago uh, when we all went into the weirdest times that any of us have ever experienced, and now we're back at it. OSU Research on Tap here at the wonderful Iron Monk Brewery and Tap Room. So welcome, we're going to uh, jump right in. I'll introduce my guest and we'll get going. For those of you who've never been to this before, it's an informal conversation between myself and a guest where we'll talk about some uh, great stuff going on at Oklahoma State University. And then we'll open up for some questions and have a little fun. Please don't forget there's a, uh, a tap room bar right up there. And please, uh, please help yourself to that at any time. Very informal environment. So let me welcome you back to OSU Research on Tap. And then let me welcome back, or welcome to Research on Tap, uh, our, our guest, our returning guest here, which is, who is Dr. Jerry Malayer. Uh, Dr. Malayer is the Senior Associate Dean for Research in the College of Veterinary Medicine and Professor and McCaslin Chair in the Department of Physiological Sciences. So we're going to talk to you today, or he's going to talk to us today, about how OSU veterinary researchers are saving the world, pandemics, and even scarier stuff. So help me welcome Dr. Jerry Malayer. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Jerry, I, I normally focus in immediately and almost exclusively on the specific research of my guest. And we're gonna do some of that a little bit later, but I'd like us to start because of what we've all come through and hopefully getting to the other side of here, this pandemic. I, I'd like to start out with your knowledge about how the researchers in the College of Veterinary Medicine at OSU are doing work to combat the, the coronavirus. Uh, now, first off, I know you're not a veterinarian. Right. Um, right. So even though you're faculty in the College of Veterinary Medicine, so what types of research expertise is in College of Veterinary Medicine? Well, thank you, thank you Kenneth. Uh, it's uh, very wide ranging, the kind of research that we do in a college. Um, there are a couple of really world class programs that we feature. One is in veterinary parasitology. Uh, that has been going on since really the founding of our college. Uh, there was a, one of the original faculty was a fellow named Wendell Kroll, who uh, uh, really founding father of veterinary parasitology. That program over the years has had a number of iterations, and, and you know, that goes back to the 1940s, obviously, a number of iterations and then in collaboration with our entomology department here on the campus, uh, who have a number of experts in the physiology of ticks, and other arthropods. Starting to say, veterinary insects. parasitology is kind of a fancy term. We usually just call them the tick guys. I the think. tick, well, tick-borne disease, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, it really is a world-renowned, world-class program. We have uh, also the National Center for Veterinary Parasitology here. Another program that goes back a long way is our program in respiratory diseases. Um, and it, this had its origins, again, back in the 1940s and 50s uh, with respiratory disease in cattle. Uh, you may have heard of shipping fever pneumonia in cattle. It's a huge economic impact on the industry in the state. And we've had a number of researchers over the years who have worked on the, the pathogens associated with that disease uh, in cattle. That has led us now into um, using small animal models and uh, translational research looking at human respiratory diseases. So we, we have researchers working on influenza, um, respiratory syncytial virus, which is a real problem in human infants. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and other related uh, viruses. Um, and we have a, an NIH-funded center for respiratory disease led by Dr. Lynn Liu. So um, uh, in addition to that, um, you know, diseases of aging. You know, your pets age just, just as we do, and so osteoarthritis and diseases of joints, um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, cancer, uh, are all afflictions of our, of our companion animals that uh, we have programmed uh, to research. Um, 
Toxicology is a big program for us. Um, I mentioned viruses, you know, herpes viruses are an important problem in, in livestock uh, and us. Uh, anybody ever had mononucleosis? You had a herpes virus? Um, and, um, you know, one of the leading, leading uh, bovine herpes virus researchers in the whole world is, is at our college. So wow. uh, we feature a number of really, really good programs and really top flight researchers to go with them. Now, speaking of the respiratory diseases and the animal disease, I, I know that the folks at the Oklahoma Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory were very key early in the pandemic in being a big part of how OSU contributed to the testing effort. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that expertise on animal diseases allowed us to, to, to kind of pivot and turn to uh, the COVID testing. Sure. Is, is that because COVID is believed to have started in animals or are there other reasons for that, for that ability? Well, you know, the, the diagnostic that we had was a, was a, a PCR test, polymerase chain reaction uh, test for the uh, looking for the genome of the virus. Right. Okay, so it doesn't matter if that sample comes from a human or from an animal, you're still looking for the genetic material of the virus in the test, right? Gotcha. So it's the same thing. Um, where, where the Oklahoma Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab really comes into it is that it was an exercise in disease surveillance, right? We're, we're, we're having people take this test uh, in, in Stillwater and in Payne County and in Oklahoma and we are determining who, who has the disease, what's the prevalence of the, of the disease, what's its location. That's the same thing you do with our cattle and with our swine and with our sheep and goats. We're constantly surveilling those populations, uh, looking for primarily the absence of disease, um, but it can also be early detection. When and, we in, find it. and in large numbers, too. And in which, large numbers. Which they're used, they were used to dealing with. Yes, large and so they, you know, they processed over 100,000 samples by the, time, by the time it was over. And sometimes in lots of, what, 2,000 at a time. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's their bread and butter. It's right in the wheelhouse of the, what that lab does all the time. So, so that's the diagnostic side. Uh, what kinds of research related to the pandemic or, or, or CVM faculty involved in, you know, beyond just being able to diagnose, is it, is it there or not? Sure. Um, well, new generations of, of diagnostic tests, um, faster, cheaper, um, you know, where you don't need a lot of sophisticated equipment or laboratories. Um, and we've been working with some companies to test those kinds of things. Um, we can work with the virus in, in our containment laboratories. And so we look at the, the genome comparison of the variants that we see uh, in the, uh, uh, the genetic material of the virus. Uh, we can um, look at uh, animals. Uh, you, you, you probably have heard that, that cats will get COVID disease. And so cats, minks, dogs, hamsters. Um, and um, so- I don't even know if you know this. I, the, the very first interactions with uh, the Oklahoma Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory that we had about potentially doing COVID was very, very early on in the, b before, before we were using the term pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, one, one, of the, uh, one, of, one of the researchers and, and scientists at the Oklahoma Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory was reading about the coronavirus in China and so forth mm -hmm. and, and thought, you know what? It, there's at some point somebody's going to say, hey, does my dog or does my cat have this? Right. So they actually ordered some reagents. Everybody remembers the, when reagents were on short supply. So they actually ordered some reagents before anybody was thinking about doing testing like we eventually needed to do very rapidly. And they had, they had some of these in the freezer, literally waiting, thinking it wasn't, wasn't tons, but it right. already developed right. a supply chain with the uh, with Thermo Fisher, the company that uh, right. had that particular test, so it would, and it was it was not thinking, gee, we'll get into the human testing business. It was somebody's going to want to know if their dog or their cat has this, right. and right. of course, we only later found out that very unlikely with dogs, but it certainly can happen. Can with happen cats. in cats, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and before you think I got to go home and and get rid of my dog or or you know ban them to the outer edges of the property, they probably got it from you. So, um, you know, we, um, uh, one, of our, one of our researchers, uh, Dr. Craig Miller, who's here, uh, and Dr. Jennifer Rudd, uh, you know, they, they studied how this disease manifests itself in cats. Um, 
which helps us understand it in humans, but it also will help us uh, to, to diagnose and treat cats uh, when that day comes that we start to really focus on that. So that's important, important work. We've got, uh, you know, looking at um, uh, vaccine candidates, looking at uh, adjuvants for the vaccines, uh, just a whole range of things. So both on the understanding the disease side, but also the potential therapeutics yeah. with the vaccines yeah. and prevention and therapeutics. Right, right. The, um, now, you mentioned containment labs. Now, I, I would think, and I think most of us would think, that uh, working with this virus it was a little dangerous. How is how's that handled? What does that actually mean to to uh, contain this virus as we work on it scientifically? Sure. Well, uh, we make the graduate students do it, right? Make the graduate students do it. It makes it much safer for the faculty. That yeah. is absolutely yeah. true. No, I'm, I'm kidding, uh, of course. Uh, no, I, you know, I think you're only partly kidding, but go we, ahead. We, we work, you know, we work with a variety of pathogens of, of animals and also humans. There are, you know, a, a lot of diseases that cross between you know, animals and humans. Uh, we call them zoonotic diseases. Uh, coronaviruses are, are one type of disease that does that. Um, zoonotic meaning it can transfer it, from animals to humans, it or can, is that well, or both is that, ways? It, it can, go it both can ways. jump. It can jump from one species of host to another. Gotcha. Right. So. Um, we, we classify these things on risk levels, and so there are four risk levels, one through four, four being the highest risk, um, and we uh, designate um, uh, control systems, uh, administrative controls, which is procedures and regulatory apparatus, uh, and then engineering controls, meaning the, the sort of containment lab you build and the, and the sort of equipment you use to contain the pathogen, uh, and then the personal protective equipment that people use uh, and at each, as, as the risk goes up, you ramp up the control systems uh, to contain it appropriately. And so, you know, biosafety level one is this environment here, for example. We could I mean, do biosafety level one research in this room, right? Yeah, yeah. we could, we could. We, uh, biosafety level two implies some things there that can make you sick, don't eat it. So we don't, you know, you can't eat, drink apply cosmetics, contact lenses, you know, all of that. Keep your hands away from your, your mouth and all that. Um, we wear lab coats for personal protective equipment and we wear gloves. Uh, when we get into biosafety level three, that, that, in, that infers pathogens that can make us sick. But we take a course of antibiotics or antiviral drugs and we'll probably be okay, probably. Um, and so there we have uh, um, engineering controls that include controlling the air flows in the spaces so there's no shared air from one space to another, all the air is filtered, uh, and, uh, and then personal protective equipment that might include a respirator, uh, a, a more, more uh, uh, detailed a suit than a lab coat, maybe a Tyvek um, a suit, uh, and of course gloves and then, and then masks and all of that. So, um, uh, and there's no level four in Oklahoma, okay? There's uh, level four infers that you're working with a pathogen, uh, and if you're, if you're exposed, you may die, and we can't do anything about it. Ebola is an example, uh, and the nearest uh, biosafety level four activity is in Galveston, Texas, so we don't... And I think some being yeah. constructed in Manhattan, Kansas. In Manhattan, Kansas, yeah. yep. 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 Absolutely. So, so for... Coronavirus, is that BSL-3, biosafety level three, where we do that kind of work? Yeah, it's biosafety level three. And um, uh, again, all the, all the exhaust air is filtered out of the rooms. We keep everything isolated and use the, uh, the personal protective equipment. Uh, and and it's quite highly regulated. Yeah, and you mentioned the, the administrative safety procedures too. So right. having very strict kind of checklists of things to do when and even how to put the personal protective equipment on and so forth. Right, all of those, all of those uh, uh, standard operating procedures have to be spelled out. Um, when we work with um, uh, what, are, what are defined as select agents, and this, this is the list of about 25 um, uh, agents that the federal government deems to be potential bio threats. Um, you know, we have to undergo background checks. Um, you know, uh, personnel uh, assurance rules, make sure that we're not gonna hand this off to somebody who shouldn't have it or misuse it in any way. Um, what's interesting about that list of select agents is there's, there's 
um, what are called tier one bacterial select agents, which includes anthrax and Yersinia pestis, which is the, the bacteria that causes plague, um, Francisella tularensis, which causes tularemia. These are endemic to Oklahoma. They're, they're, they exist here. They exist here they're without the, anybody sending them in a envelope. Yeah, right. they're in the environment, and uh, occasionally the diagnostic lab will get a an animal case sent in that has one of those diseases. So it's um, you know it's limited in one way, and in another way you think, well, it's out there. I could go find it. I could you know. Yeah. But don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go looking for anthrax in the environment. Right. Right. Well. I think this is actually a really good transition point. We've been talking, I wanted, I wanted everyone to get a sense of the incredible breadth of, uh, of research going on in the College of Veterinary Medicine that is directly attacking coronavirus, respiratory disease, and things that, that are gonna help get us out of this fix that we've been in for a year and a half. Um, but this also gives us a good segue into your, your, own, your own research area which is related to bioweapons, as I understand it. Um, now, I know there's some aspects of this research that you can't actually talk about right, right. unless we knew that all of you had security clearances and we locked the doors and do some other things. But since we don't know that, yeah. um, we're not gonna talk about those things. But there's, a, there's at least one area that I think you, you can discuss, even on a broad level. Can you? Are, we, we talked about before, something related to location analysis? Location, yeah, is it, yeah, yeah. You, I think you yeah. use the term forensics or somewhere yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, for, first, let's be absolutely clear. We do not make bioweapons, okay? We are interested in mitigating the threat of a bioweapon. So um, some of the work we're doing now is to uh, see if we can identify the variations in um, some of these pathogens that are collected from different parts of the world. And how much variation is there um, from one part of the so world? Things like to another. anthrax, things like E. coli. What, what, what are we doing? Well, anthrax, Yersinia, gotcha. um, Tularensis. Gotcha. Uh, you know, some of those organisms that may have begun to evolve in different directions because they're geographically isolated. Uh, and, and can we, on the basis of that variation, um, tell you that that particular strain or that, that, that biovar came from Asia, Europe, South America, so like, and so forth. For instance, with the yeah. coronavirus, we hear the variants and this one popped up in India or this one popped right. up in UK, but because we're in a pandemic, then it just swirls all around the world. But around. with these things being in much smaller supplies, the, the, the variants or the, the variations in genetics might be kind of geographically a, foot, a fingerprint, if you will. Yeah, a fingerprint. They're, they're, they're less likely to be moving around the way this virus has, yeah. or the way that you know, any other respiratory virus or uh, highly contagious virus of humans. Because, I mean, we're moving around and it moves with us. It's very adaptable. Um, and, you know, for example, we found um, variants in Oklahoma uh, early on in the pandemic that um, were very similar to uh, isolates that had come from Australia and from the west coast of the United States. And then another one, also from a patient in Oklahoma, that was very similar to an isolate that came from Greece uh, hmm. and, and also had popped up in Atlanta. So, um, you know, the thing was moving around and, and kind of coming at us from both, both sides, you know. Uh, and uh, um, but but having the, the ability to do that that genomic fingerprint uh, is really really powerful in being able to track you know how these diseases move around in the environment how they move around the environment but in the case of a bio attack right. this would also be as you know using the fingerprint analogy a way to come in and say you know this one didn't come from Oklahoma this one came from most right. likely from Right? Am I getting that right? Right, you, right. Do you and see that variant that... I mean, some of the, you know, back when they had the anthrax attacks in Washington, D.C., there was, there was a trace back to um, a lab at CDC. And they weren't, they they weren't doing people. that from labels on the box. They were doing that from the from genetic the, yeah. level of what the... Right, from the DNA sequences you know, yeah. in the genomes. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, if I were one of your graduate students, we joked around about 
but the, but the reality is they have to learn how to do all this stuff. So, right. but to, to do this kind of work, to, to what, what are they doing? What, is, what does their day look like when they're involved in one of your projects? Sure. Well, they have to learn how to handle the organism, obviously, and work in that, in that BL3 environment. environment. Yep. And you know, understand all of the administrative control, understand the engineering controls, the, the personal protective equipment, do all of that, and then culture the organism of interest. And then we have to harvest that and process it for the analytical part of it, whether we're gonna do a DNA sequence or we're gonna do uh, an analysis of the proteome, the proteins that it's expressing. Do you um, do that primarily with, with um, um, what, what kind of tool to use to do the prote proteome? Uh, mass spectrometry, mass yeah, yeah, yeah. And so for, in both those cases, we have to, we have to uh, bring that analyte out of the lab and document that it is free of any live organism. So by the time you're analyzing it at that level, it's no longer the live organism that could, could hurt you. It's not, yeah, it's not, uh, it won't cause any disease at that point or, or uh, survive in the environment very long. Um, and, then, and then, you know, how to take that data uh, and analyze that data, handle those data sets. Uh, you know, bioinformatics is an emerging um, field in, in biology in general because we're, we're able now with these analytical tools that we have to generate so much data about these organisms that we have to have very specialized tools just to manage and interpret uh, the data that we're getting. So they go from personal protective equipment to sitting behind the computer analyzing data. Yep. Is kind of the, yep. the secret. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's take a quick break here. I'm going to come back and ask you a little bit more about your research, but I want to. Okay. Uh, I, I want to make a few announcements, say a few things that, that uh, kind of update people. First of all, be on the local brew. Don't forget that Iron Monk also serves soda and wine. I personally like the brew, but I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, so they've got some other things for you there. Um, I'd like to also mention that every day that Iron Monk is open is a special day, but Thursdays tend to be particularly special, so I take a look at uh, events going on at Iron Monk. Thursdays are often new beer release days. I know that this Thursday, releasing a new beer, and they also tend to have music, and I'm gonna blank on the guy's name who's this Thursday, but they have music this Thursday at 7.30, and almost always a food truck on that day too, so lots of good things going on at Iron Monk. Uh, for all things Iron Monk, including their music, their live trivia, things like research on tap, new beer releases, food trucks, et cetera. Um, take a look at their Facebook page, Instagram page. They keep that very up to date. A uh, couple of um, OSU related announcements. One of our scheduled guests for research on tap is an architecture professor at OSU who is also an artist. His name is Mode Bilbazi, and he has a current exhibition going on at the OSU Museum of Art right now. And on Friday evening, I believe it's at five o'clock at the OSU Museum of Art, there, which is right here downtown, there will be a, a reception, kind of an opening reception, even though the exhibition's going on. So get by there and see the exhibition. Mode Bilbazi, if you've not seen his art, it's very intriguing. It has an architectural flair to it. But it's not just it's not drawings of just drawings of buildings. It's 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 some really interesting things. So stop by and see that and attend the reception on Friday if you're available. Uh, also coming up on Saturday, there's this little tiny event that goes on in Stillwater. It's called the Remember the Ten Run. Anybody heard of the Remember the Ten Run? Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's this coming Saturday. Um, check out their website. I believe it's uh, rememberthe10.com. Is that right, Jason? Is Jason here to tell me I'm right or wrong? Anyway, check out their website and social media for that, uh, for that event. Uh, Iron Monk hosted their, their packet distribution day this last Saturday, and that was a, that was a great event right here at Iron Monk. Um, now, OSU Research on Tap, these, these, scenes of, these things that we do here uh, also can be viewed on O-State TV, and a special edit of the show series is, is being cut as a podcast. So take a look at o State TV and at, at uh, the media group out of Oklahoma State University if you'd, if you'd like to, if you enjoyed this and want to pass it on to a friend or want to listen to something that uh, Dr. Malayer said again, uh, that should be available to you. I'll say one quick thing. Everybody gets real intense listening to this great stuff and forgets that those taps up there still work. So feel free to get up and grab another beer. Um, last announcement, and then we'll get back to Dr. Malayer. 
our next research on tap. We have five uh, Mondays this month, so we picked the fourth one so that we weren't right uh, crossing up with the first day of classes and all that. But normally we'll do the third, the third Monday of the month. So our next research on tap will be on September 20th at 5.30 right here at Iron Monk. I'll tease you with the, uh, the guest in the title at the end of the show tonight. So that's our announcements. Before we go to Q&A with this, with this wonderfully attentive audience that may be not drinking enough Iron Monk beer, but that's a separate problem, um, I, I, I do want to, to, uh, to, to ask you kind of one, one last question before I get out of the way and let the audience ask questions. Mm -hmm. Considering all the, the important work that you facilitate as the Associate Dean for Research at the College of Veterinary Medicine, as well as your own research program, I, I want to ask you, this, some of this is scary stuff, you know, like pandemics and weapons of mass destruction and bioweapons and so forth. Uh, what keeps you up at night? Well, I, <clears throat> you know, this, uh, this pandemic uh, went around the world so fast um, and uh, just kind of overwhelmed us in many, many ways. You know, fortunately, we had um, 20 years of background in the work that led to the development of these vaccines that we have access to. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine got full approval today, by the way, from the FDA. Yes, that's a big announcement. Um, um, and you know what it, what it showed in the, you know, I mentioned that, you know, we had one coming from the West, we had one coming from the East, and they, you know, they sort of converged uh, in Oklahoma. These pandemics, and it doesn't have to be a human pandemic, it can be an animal pandemic, it can be a plant pandemic, uh, have the potential to drop in on us from north, south, east, west, um, uh, with very little warning and cause serious economic damage, serious damage to our way of life and to our health and well-being. Um, and, you know, I wonder, you know, when this happens again, and it probably will, are we going to be ready for that? Um, there is um, estimated to be over, over um, a trillion different kinds of microbes on this planet. A trillion. A trillion. With a T. And, you know, we've described about 1,400 human pathogens. And described about, meaning kind we, of figured out what it is. We know what it is, yeah. yeah. We know what's out there. Um, we've seen it make people sick. And, you know, about maybe another six, 700 of animal, important animal pathogens and important plant pathogens. So maybe 2,000, 2,500. Um, out, out of the out, trillion. Out of the trillion. So what's the probability that there's many, many, many more out there that we just haven't run across yet? Um, because they're in the, you know, the foothills of the, you know, the Alps or the, you know, um, the, 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 you know around the uh, Central Asia or just places that are lowly populated with humans and they, we just haven't hit on them yet. So, uh, you know, as these things begin to come up, and start to emerge, <clears throat> and it's, it's estimated that 70% of emerging infectious disease around the world is zoonotic, meaning it animals, people, animals, people, you know, transmitting it around. And, you know, every time a virus mutates, it's the potential for another pandemic. So I just, I hope that we as a, as a country and civilization in general makes the investments necessary in the science so that we understand uh, the best way to pick these things up when we find them, uh, identify what they are as fast as we can, and have therapeutics or vaccines as quickly as we can get them uh, so that we don't suffer as we have the last Yeah, I think months. two years ago that, that worry would have met with most of us kind of as an abstract concept. Right. It's not abstract anymore. Right, right. You know, we had a few years back, we had, a, we had another SARS virus uh, 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 that um, I think 2,000 people around the world sickened and died from it. And the weird uh, blessing from that one is it made you really, really sick before you could really infect somebody else with it. Yeah. Weird thing yeah. to say is a blessing. But, and, but we, we realized then how fast it could move. It yep. came from Asia to, you know, Canada. There was a big outbreak in Canada. And... You know, it, it, it was a lesson, but we didn't, we didn't pick up on it. We didn't, we didn't realize it, would, it could do um, the damage that this virus has done. So. Well, I, for one, am really glad that the OSU College of Veterinary Medicine is there with its research uh, teams 
working on these various topics. So let, let's transition now and open up for uh, audience questions. Since we are doing this uh, for, uh, for the, for the uh, recordings and so forth, we have our wonderful um, uh, microphone ball, a great orange covered microphone ball, that if you'd like to ask a question, we'd ask you to hold that ball and speak loudly into that ball. Uh, so who, who would like to ask a question of Dr. Miller? Right here. Please identify yourself before you ask a question. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Kristen, and I'm actually a grad student in Dr. Miller's department. Uh oh, she's a plant. <laughs> she's a plant. I'm new, but I was just wondering. I study wildlife diseases, and yeah. do you feel like this is a field that is going to continue to grow and be invested in, since we need to be surveilling for that next pandemic? Yeah, I, I hope so. I, you know, wildlife. I didn't really say much about, but but the wildlife reservoirs for a lot of these diseases are very important in the the overall life cycle of some of these pathogens and um, you know the other the other aspect of it as you as you know is that as we see climate variability uh, our, our wildlife moves and extends into new areas and uh, some of the arthropod vectors that feed on the wildlife that then transmit the, the disease to another animal you know they're moving around too so we're constantly surveying populations and surveilling for the presence of some of these diseases. It's, uh, it's, a, it, 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 it's changing, and we have to keep up with that. Yeah. Next question, where are we? Way over there in the corner, through the glass. Hey, Jerry, Ray Hunky. Ray. Retired professor, thank God. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you you look the part today, Ray. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. I've heard that the COVID will be with us forever. Is that true? I think so. I'd say that, but I think so. It's like going to be like influenza, you know. And hopefully, enough people are vaccinated, and we get we can get a booster shot. And uh, but I think I think we'll find that if people don't take care of themselves and watch out for it, it'll be we'll have this seasonal fluctuation, uh, and it'll keep coming back. Um, it's it's unfortunate, but probably will. Yeah. And you know, the other, the other thing is, is the so-called long COVID, right? So um, you, have various, you have various comorbidities that occur when people do get the virus and COVID um, that makes them more susceptible or have you know, longer, longer uh, uh, disease process. Um, and then with some people, effects linger. And we still don't know how long some of that can happen for people. So I, I yeah, the effects, of it and the virus itself, I think are gonna be around. It's unfortunate. Next question. One right over here. Hi, my name is Bree. I'm a new faculty here and I just have a question. Um, so, you know, it sounds like COVID's gonna be with us for a while. But this question is maybe a little more health promotion <clears throat> oriented. A lot of our rural areas are very vaccine hesitant, including where I'm from in Colorado. What would be your message to folks in those communities um, with their doubts of the vaccine and things of that nature? Well, I think one is, is you know, take an objective look at what's going on in the world around you um, and um, turn off your Facebook account, maybe. Um, but um, Heresy. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. My, my message from the beginning would have been, you know, we're all in this together. The, the, the kind thing to do for your neighbor, the patriotic thing to do for your country, is to deal with this and get vaccinated. Unfortunately, that wasn't, that wasn't necessarily the message always. Um, but uh, I think, uh, you know, for people who are vaccine hesitant in rural areas, you know, we've, we've always used vaccines to control disease. Everybody's children had a vaccine before they could go to school for, you know, measles and mumps, you know. We, polio. Polio, smallpox, you know, and, and I'm sure most of those people, if they're in the farming and ranching business, are, use vaccines for their, for their animals. And so I think just those, those real life examples of how vaccines have benefited us uh, could, be, could be a very positive message. I don't know, do you have a better 
better message maybe. <laughs> You know, this is part of part of this is is you know it's the infectious disease part, right? That 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 we deal with. But you know, sociology people and, and, and economists and education people, and marketing, all of that. There's there's elements of this that all of those people could be contributing uh, to as well. And I think many are in, in in different ways. But it's a it's a very multifaceted problem in our society to to convince people and, to do these things. And I'm not an expert on this public communication side of things, but it's, it seems to me just like we had to sort of start from scratch in figuring out what this pathogen was and, and how to build a vaccine against it. We also were a little bit flat-footed on this more um, public communication, public awareness side. Yeah. And just as you were talking about, will we be ready for the next one? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's things we can do on on that public, not just public education, but public discussion, mm -hmm. so that maybe if we encounter this again, we won't be as as as, yeah. as split on our acceptance of the vaccines as they come out. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if we could, yeah, if we could, on many issues, become less polarized and, and have more communication, we'd be, be better off. Yeah. yeah. Another question for Dr. Malayer. This will be a tough one. This will be a tough one. Get a microbiologist asking a question. <laughs> I'm going to throw one right down the middle, Jerry. I'm Terrell Conway. Uh, so we all know people who have not gotten vaccinated. And one of the excuses I hear is these messenger RNA vaccines were developed so quickly, we're just not ready yet. I'm going to make the decision after there's more information, and then they lose loved ones to the disease. and and you know, tends to, to change their tune on this a little bit. But let's, let's talk a little bit about the development of this vaccine and maybe how that prepares us for the development of vaccines against the, the next pandemic virus. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, the, the, these messenger RNA vaccines have been under development for many, many, many years. You know, the technology that went into that is something we've been hearing about for, what, 20 years. You know, you can make a vaccine by getting your own cells to express, uh, you know, a protein from nucleic acid that you put in there, you know. And it's, it's all you're doing is using your own body as the incubator to make the, the protein antigen. So instead you're not of making just the in, virus, you're, you're not, making a protein that has some mimicry of aspects of the virus. Right, yeah. And you know what a vaccine company does is they, they do that in a vat and they make a bunch of protein and then they, that's what, that's what your vaccine is. They just inject that protein, and then your immune system responds to it. So this is just bypassing that step. In, in many ways, it's a better, much better solution. Um, and, um, you know, it's, um, uh, that, that again, that technology's been around, and uh, this was really the first opportunity that there was the urgency to do it, you know? The economics of the pharmaceutical industry are such that if there's no urgency, they're not going to press to make a new vaccine for something. They've got vaccines for the stuff they want to, you know, they want to give you, uh, and they're making a nice, a nice living on it. And um, but here was a case where we needed that vaccine quick, and so they just brought these tools in and put them to work. And it's it's really a it's amazing thing. One last question for Dr. Malaire. Right here. So are the companies, and do you think, oh, do you think they'll be including different variants uh, like the flu is or some of the others? You know, like 10 or 15 variants as they come along? In terms of making the new vaccines to specifically yeah. address them? COVID. Yeah, for COVID, yeah. For COVID. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so making a, you know, putting in different, different um, uh, templates to produce different variants of the, of the viral proteins to, to make the vaccine more, uh, give it more um, uh, advantages yeah. against whatever might come up new. So you far know, it seems that the, the vaccines have held pretty well against variants, that could, that could obviously change, but the, uh, the, the tests have been a little more challenged with some of the variants. The from tests it. have been challenged, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, and of course, I mean, we're hearing about these breakthrough with the, with the Delta variant, right? That right. people are vaccinated and they, and, they, and they still get 
So I think, I, yeah, I think the pharmaceutical companies are going to have to figure out how to do that. Um, obviously, they can't, make a, they can't make a variant against something they haven't seen yet. So as these new, uh, new, new viruses come at us, yeah, I, I think it would, be, it would be crazy for a pharmaceutical company that's already in that business not to incorporate that into their vaccine formulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly hope they will. Yeah. I said last question, but I'll let one more if somebody's got a burning question. All right, let Jerry have a minute to take a sip before we close things out. I want to ask, I want to ask the audience a question myself. Is anybody here, come, did you come here having no idea we were doing research on tap, but you heard it start, so you stayed all the way to now? Is there anybody like that? Okay, so most people, most people had heard about it, or you saw it going on and decided to take your conversation elsewhere. That's all good. Okay. That's good. The, um, research on tap fans. Is there anybody here who this is your very first research on tap to attend? Oh, a bunch. A bunch. Okay. Well, tell you what, we've only got a couple of these, so it has to be first timers. And if you're really motivated, come up, come up and check with me right after, right after we close out. We've got a couple of these. First timers only. This is our research, OSU Research on Tap, branded combination stainless steel cup with a lid and all that stuff, just like your, you know, your Starbucks stainless steel. But you can also flip it over, and it is one of those fun little koozie stainless steel koozie thing. So it's a really cool little piece of swag. Have a couple of those. So first timers who really want it, don't start crowding to the front already. Just say, hang on. Um, we got a couple of those for you. Um, I also have a gift for Dr. Malayer that I'm gonna get him just here in one moment. But first, I wanna tell you about our next research on tap. You actually set it up for us. You talked about how the, the, the animal world, the environment and plants and the humans are all interconnected and there are outbreaks on the animal side, there are outbreaks on the human side and on the plant side. Well, one of the outbreaks that we have on occasion with a really important plant in this state is wheat. Aphids on wheat. So our topic next time is going to be where have all the insects gone? We've had a recent decline in pests in wheat and we have Dr. Chris Giles, Regents Professor of Entomology and Plant Pathology, who's going to unpack why we've had far fewer outbreaks of aphids on wheat, and how, how we've gotten there, what we've learned from it, and then what we can uh, potentially do for other important plant crops uh, to, to minimize the uh, frequency of these damaging outbreaks. So that is on September 20th at 5.30, Dr. Chris Giles, right here at Iron Monk. Now, a tradition of OSU Research on Tap is to present our speaker with the OSU Research on Tap medallion that also has a convenient little bottle opener built right into it. So, Dr. Malayer, thank you so much for being here today. Help me thank Dr. Malayer. Thank you. Thank you. So we always end OSU Research on Tap with a toast. Oh, Jerry, you should have saved the sip, but you can pretend. <laughs> that sip's uh, a little in All right, it's a little in there. Uh, we always end with a toast. We normally end it with this toast that's modeled after the review criteria for the National Science Foundation. And, but most of the work that we've been talking about today, much of that work is, is, uh, uh, is National Institutes of Health funded, some of it. And, and so I've altered the, the toast. So this incorporates the, uh, the review criteria for the National Institutes of Health in our, our toast because that means you'll get lots more money to do lots of more cool research. So you, may your environment be rich, your approach be unique, and your collaborators be strong so that your endeavors may be innovative and significant. Here, here. Thanks everybody, we'll see you next time. <laughs>